My name is Peter Chisholm. I want to welcome, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, President Javier Ceballos, who you will hear from shortly, and the Framingham student community, we want to welcome you here today for this special event when we remember the 2,606 people who died at the World Trade Center, the 265 people on the four planes, and the 125 people in the Pentagon. Because of my background as a call firefighter in Ashland, I knew a lot about the fire department in New York. On a few occasions, some fellow firefighters myself went to New York to used to ride with the guys on their apparatus. And I always brought them by to visit the Pride of Midtown, Engine 54, Ladder 4, and Battalion 9. It's a station on 8th Avenue and West 48th Street, where presidents and vice presidents throughout the years have always stopped to say hello. Their motto is, never miss the performance. And on September 11th, they were at the big one. You may have heard the saying, all gave some, some gave all. That day, 17 members of the Pride of Midtown gave all. I also want to, take, want, I want, want, I want to ask that we take a few moments to, to think and remember the 343, all the 343 members of the fire department who died in the fire of duty, on duty that day and still continue to die 20 years later from diseases picked up in the days, the weeks, the months and the years following September 11th. And lest we forget, please remember the 23 officers of the New York Police Department and the 37 officers from the Port of New York and New Jersey Police Department who gave their lives on September 11th. Many have asked, why, do, why did so many have to die? Watch the films of that day as civilians run for shelter while police and fire are running in. In the months following the attack, I attended several firefighter funerals, including one where guests were asked to please send a note to the, to the surviving children about their dad, and one when I entered an empty rectory prior to the mass to use the restroom. When I exited the, when I exited the restroom, there were three plainclothes detectives there, I and me. They were from the mayor's security detail, and watching, I noticed out the corner of my eye the mayor of the city of New York, Rudy Giuliani, Rudy Giuliani, came over to shake my hand and thank you for attending the service because I was wearing my Class A uniform. And we talked for a few minutes. During these months of funerals, firefighters came from all over to say goodbye to their brothers, including one in December. We were lining up when a, funeral, when a fellow came running over with a garment bag over his shoulder. He was directed where he could change into his, um, where he could change into his uniform. He explained he had just arrived on a red-eye flight from Seattle, Washington. And please, in your prayers today, remember the United States Marine Corps Sergeant Yohani Rosario of Lawrence. This daughter of Massachusetts comes home for the final time this Saturday, September 11th. As I conclude, I want to do so on a more pleasant note. I don't know if any of you read this particular story, but there was a young man and a person in Afghanistan lived there who served as an interpreter for a United States Army unit. He later immigrated to the United States and joined the Army. He was trying desperately to get his family um, out of Afghanistan. As uh, came closer and closer to the deadline, um, he talked to people he knew. One Marine, I guess he knew, talked to another, and word reached Congress in Seth Moulton's office, Massachusetts where they, uh, they got the word that a soldier needed help. To make a Massachusetts, to make a long story short, and, to add the, and how they added the Massachusetts flair to it, uh, let me just tell you. About two weeks later, um, late at night, the family showed up at a location where they'd been told to report. They waited for a while, a couple of trucks pulled up. They, were, they contained the United States Marines. Nervously, the family walked over. They weren't sure who they were, they just saw these trucks with soldiers. They walked over and they said what they were told to say, Tom Brady. When they said Tom Brady, the Marines said, get in, we're off to the United States. And the family's in the United States today. Right now, I want to take a moment to introduce to all of you the president of Framingham State University, my boss, President Javier Files. He's the one who uh, is here doing this today. 
Yeah, that's a great job laying it. Thanks, Peter. And good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this very, very special event. It's really hard to believe that it's been 20 years since that Saturday, this Saturday, since that horrific, horrific attack that occurred in 9-11. I know that all of us that were here remember exactly where we were when we saw that happening. And now, you know, 20 years later, we have students on our campus that were not born when the towers fell. Of course, today we're dealing with a different uh, tragedy or a much different scale with the COVID-19 pandemic. There is one similarity, however, between 9-11 and the current pandemic, and that is that our first responders are once again taking the lead in getting us through it. At this time, I would just like to take a moment to quickly recognize all the first responders who are in the room with us. So please stand up, raise your hand, move, and so we can thank you for everything you do for us. Thanks for all you do to keep us safe. We are extremely honored today to hear from someone who played an integral role in the nation's response to 9-11. Andrew Card served as Chief of Staff to President George W. Bush from 2001 to 2006. After the South Tower was struck, it was Mr. Card who informed the President that America was under attack while well, he was reading to a classroom of elementary school children in Florida. And that is an iconic picture. And I saw uh, a copy that Adam Fruitt, the chair of our uh, school board has of that moment. That is a very iconic moment. A Massachusetts native, Mr. Carr's distinguished political career began as a state representative from Holbrook. He first served in the West Wing during the Reagan, Reagan administration and was later appointed U.S. Secretary of Transportation for President George H.W. Bush. His post-government career included time as the acting dean of the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas, at Texas A&M University, and in 2014, he was elected as the fifth president of Franklin Pierce University in Ringe, New Hampshire. So ladies and gentlemen, it's a real honor for me to introduce Mr. Andrew Card. Thank you, President Sparrows and Reverend Clergy, elected officials, and first responders, faculty, students, friends, trustees. It is a privilege to be here. I am from Holbrook, which is not that far away. So I can park the car in Harvard Yard and you would understand me. In most places where I speak around the country, they don't. I'm thrilled to be here because I want to talk about the promises that I made, and I know other people in the room made the same promises. We promised never to forget. Framingham State University is a special place. It's a wonderful campus because of the diversity of the students who come here and the faculty who teaches here. And it's the hope that they bring to work every day or to the classroom is what we celebrate. But the truth is, we're entering a time of memory and memorial. It's not a time of celebration. September 20th, we'll find different experiences, but for me, the experience of September 11, 2001 extended from, obviously, the message of the attack on 9-11 through the President's speech on September 20th, when we were getting ready to go to war. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't remember what happened on that day 20 years ago this coming Saturday. I was with the president. We arrived in Sarasota, Florida on the night of September 10th, 2001. After a remarkable day, September 10th had a ceremony at the Navy Yard about five miles from the White House. 
and it was a beautiful ceremony honoring the relationship between the United States and Australia. And the Australian Prime Minister was there, there was a fife and drum corps, there was a military parade, there was a pass and review, wonderful speeches, and a tribute to those men and women who helped us in World War II and recognized the great relationship we had with Australia that helped us in Vietnam and in North Korea. We left that event and we piled into Air Force One and we flew to Jacksonville, Florida. And the president went to a school in an auditorium about this size and he addressed students and teachers and raised the hope that we could get rid of the soft bigotry of low expectation and that we could change the nature of education so that everybody would benefit by it in our great country. As a sidebar, I'd point out that Massachusetts leads the nation in terms of educational opportunity because it's in our Constitution. But the President was committed to talking about getting more kids to stay in school longer, to do better, and to get rid of the bigotry of saying, you passed just because you aged a year. He wanted students to learn. Leave no child behind. So after the event in Jacksonville, Florida, we flew across the state of Florida to Sarasota. And we landed at dusk. And I remember when the motorcade pulled up to the Colony Resort, which was a tennis and golf resort, there's a terrible stench in the air. The red tide had killed fish, they'd washed up on the shore, and I was struck by the terrible stench. We dropped our luggage off into the Colony Resort, and then we turned around and went back out and got into the cars that were in the limousines or the motorcade of the president. And we drove over to Tampa, St. Pete, to a restaurant. And the president actually didn't have to perform at any event. He was having dinner with a bunch of friends that his brother, the governor of Florida at the time, Jed Bush, had put together. And the president stayed out late, something that George W. Bush did not like to do because he was having a good time. And I remember coming back to the Colony Resort about an hour later than we were scheduled to, and I still had work to do. And the president went up to go to bed, and I went to my office or my hotel room and did some work and got to bed pretty late. I woke up early the next morning knowing that the president was going to go to an elementary school, but I also knew he was going out for a jog. And I decided I would go out and check on the advance team and the Secret Service, and I stepped out of the hotel, and sure enough, that terrible red tide stench was still there, and I directed the advance team to change the motorcade around. I talked with the Secret Service agents, and then I tracked down the president's physician. And I said, if the president goes for a run today in the golf course before he goes over to the elementary school, is he going to get sick because of the red tide stench? And he says, oh, no, he'll be fine. I then went in to greet the president as he's getting up. And he was getting up out of bed, and he was putting on his running clothes because he was going to go running on the golf course. And then he was troubled because he invited a reporter to go running with him. His name was Stretch Kyle, Richard Dick Stretch Kyle. And he found out that Stretch Kyle had been an NCAA All-American cross-country runner. <laughs> and the Bushes are very competitive. They don't let the grandkids beat them at checkers. And he was completely preoccupied with running on this golf course and questioning, why did I invite Stretch Kyle to go running with me? And as he's getting ready to leave, I said, when you get back, it'll be an easy day. You're going to the Emma E. Booker School in Sarasota, and you're going to be reading a book with second graders and talking about your favorite topic, which is leaving no child behind. And he said, okay, thanks. I said, oh, by the way, I checked with the doc, and don't worry about the red tide stench, you'll be all right. And he looks at me like, you're an idiot. <laughs> I went and did some homework. The president came back from his run. He was feeling full of himself. He ran seven minute, 20 minute miles for four and a half miles. And he beat Stretch Kyle. So he was feeling pretty good. 
And he starts getting undressed, and I said, after you get undressed and then get dressed, we'll sit down and have our CIA briefing. And then we're going over to the M.E. Booker School. He said, great. We had the CIA briefing. It was done by a fellow who ended up becoming acting director of the CIA named Mike Morell. And it was a memorable briefing, but there was nothing startling in it. Nothing that would cause me to say, today is a different day. In fact, that day was a perfect day. There wasn't a cloud in the sky in the lower 48. It was a perfect day everywhere in America. After the CIA briefing, we went down and piled into limousines to go over to the Emma E. Booker School. And I remember two people asking a question. One was Carl Rove, the other one was Dan Bartlett. And they said, did anybody hear about a plane crash in New York City? No one responded. We drove over to the Emma E. Booker School and we went into a classroom that had been converted to a White House command center. And the president went to a secure phone and he called back to his national security advisor, Dr. Condoleezza Rice. I didn't listen to that conversation, but the president told me later there was nothing dramatic in the conversation. I went into the classroom to see if it was ready for the president. So I walked into the classroom, I saw the second graders all lined up with their teacher, Mrs. Daniels, Sandra D K. Daniels, and she looked beautiful and those students looked beautiful. And they were on their very best behavior. And then I looked at a group of reporters gathering in the press pool with Ari Fleischer. And they were not on their best behavior, they were on their typical behavior. I then checked the classroom out. I saw a misspelled word on a bulletin board. And I said, let's get a book cover and cover up that word. I didn't want a Dan Quayle potato moment. Most of you don't know what that was, but I do. And then I went into the holding room with the president. And I'm standing with the president and the principal of the school at the door to the classroom, but in the holding room where the White House staff is gathered. As the president and the principal are about to go into the classroom, a Navy captain by the name of Deb Lauer, who went on to become an admiral, and she was the acting national security advisor on the trip and the director of the White House Situation Room, said to the president, sir, it appears a small twin-engine prop plane has crashed into one of the towers at the World Trade Center in New York City. The president, the principal, and I all had the same reaction. Oh, what a horrible accident. The pilot must have had a heart attack or something. And then the principal opened the door to the classroom, and she and the president went into the classroom. The door shut, and I was still in the holding room. And Captain Lauer came up to me and said, Sir, it appears it was not a small twin-engine prop plane. It was a commercial jetliner. My mind flashed to the fear that the passengers on the plane must have had. They had to know it wasn't gaining altitude. I don't know why that's where my mind went, but that's where it went. But that was only a nanosecond. Because Captain Lauer came up to me and said, Oh my God. Another plane hit the other tower at the World Trade Center. My mind flashed to three initials, UBL, Osama bin Laden. I knew about the attacks on the World Trade Center in February of 1993. I knew about Al-Qaeda. I then performed a test that chiefs of staff have to perform a lot. Does the president need to know? This was an easy test to pass, yes. I decided to pass on two facts and make one obvious editorial comment, but to do nothing to invite a dialogue f with the president, because I presumed he was sitting under a boom microphone in front of a press pool and second grade students. So I decided I would not do anything to encourage him to get up or to come with me or to talk with me. I opened the door to the holding room and I thought about what I would say. As I stepped into the holding room, the teacher, Mrs. Daniels, was conducting a dialogue between the students and the president. Say good morning to the president. Good morning, Mr. President. Back and forth they went. 
And I didn't want to enter, interrupt that dialogue. And then Mrs. Daniels told the students to take out their books. And as the students were reaching under their desks to pull out their books, the pet goat, to read with the president, that's when I walked up to the president, who did not see me coming. I came from behind him. And I leaned over and whispered into his right ear, a second plane hit the second tower. America is under attack. I then stood back from the president so they didn't ask me a question. I was very impressed with how he responded. I could see his head bobbing up and down. He never turned around to me. He kind of started to. But his head was bobbing up and down. I honestly believe that was the moment that he really became the President of the United States because he was probably anticipating what his responsibilities were. And they came from the oath that he had taken at noontime on January 20th of 2001, an oath to preserve, protect, and defend. So I think that's the day that he really became the President. It wasn't his agenda. It was the obligation to keep his oath. As I went back to the door to go back to the holding room, I looked at the president again. He was still facing forward and his head was still bobbing up and down. I noticed the students were unbelievably attentive to their books. Their books were open and they were ready to read. I looked at the press pool, and all the reporters were turned around talking to Ari Fleischer, the press secretary. Nobody was looking at the president. In my left peripheral vision, I saw Secretary of Education Rod Page and the principal of the school and a White House staffer named Sandy Kress, and they were kind of mouthing, what's going on? I then stepped back into the holding room, and the first thing I said was, get the FBI director on the phone. It was Bob Mueller. He'd only been the FBI director for 10 days. I said, get a line open to the vice president. Get a line open to the White House Situation Room. Get the crew back on Air Force One and tell Mark Tillman we're going to have to leave. He was the pilot. To the Secret Service, I said, turn the motorcade around. We'll have to get ready to depart. To Dan Bartlett, the communications director on the trip, I said, get some remarks written for the president. He'll have to say something to the crowd that is gathered to hear him talk about education, but he cannot say anything we do not know to be the truth. The door opened up and in walked the president. I was very impressed that while he sat in that classroom, he did nothing to generate fear from those young kids. He did nothing to demonstrate fear that would have been translated to the sat satisfaction of the terrorists all around the world. Instead, he thought about his job. When he walked into the holy room, literally the first thing that he said was, get the FBI director on the phone. And we could say, he's right here, Mr. President. The president then went and talked to the vice president, the national security team. Then he called the governor of New York. I went around the classroom into the cafeteria gymnasium of the elementary school because I wanted to see what the president was going to be doing when he came out to speak. The crowd stood up when he walked in, and he sat them right down, and he started to speak. And the first thing he said, I'm going to have to go back to Washington, D.C. And I'm thinking to myself, he does not know that we are going back to Washington, D.C. And I got mad at Dan Bartlett, the speechwriter. I said, we don't know that we're going to Washington, D.C. It turns out Dan Bartlett did not put that in the remarks. The president just ad-libbed it. As we pile into limousines to leave the M.A. Booker School, knowing that two planes, airliners, had been used as weapons of mass destruction and hit the World Trade Center, the president is in what we call the beast, the presidential limo, I'm sitting beside him, and he's on his cell phone. I'm on my cell phone. I'm calling back to the White House. He's trying to reach the Secretary of Defense. And he's frustrated that he can't get through. I'm learning that the Pentagon has just been attacked. 
we drive very fast and we get to the air base where Air Force One was waiting for us. The limousine comes to a stop, the Secret Service opens the door to the beast, we step out, and I'm struck by the sound of the engines on Air Force One running. The protocol is that you don't start the engines until the president is safely on the plane. And I said to myself, Mark Tillman must really want to get out of here. By the way, there had been communications that said someone was using the code name for Air Force One, Angel. Does that mean that the bad guys may have a Stinger missile sitting out at the airport? We ran up the gangplank and before the door was even fully shut, the plane started to roll down the runway. And we lifted off and went kind of straight up, not the long glide path, up to about 48,000 feet and flew in a serpentine way, waiting for fighter jets to catch up with us. The president, without anybody asking him to do this, said, I want to get President Putin from Russia on the phone. I don't want him to think that we're doing something that would generate war with him, and I don't want him to react in a way that's not appropriate. I was very impressed that he did that. Nobody told him to do it, but he did. I was also impressed with the conversations that he was having with his national security team and the intelligence community from Air Force One. And yes, I was a witness to him talking with the vice president and authorizing our fighter jet pilots to shoot down commercial jetliners that were not responding to the FAA communications to land. And when the president hung up the phone, he leaned forward across his desk and said to me, I cannot imagine receiving that order. I was an Air National Guard pilot. I just can't imagine receiving that order. But I authorized it. Flight 93, United Flight 93, crashed into Shanksville, Pennsylvania a few minutes after that. I will admit that I and some others on Air Force One wondered if it was one of us that shot down that plane. But instead, it was civilians who had called from that plane to loved ones on the ground and learned about the attacks on the World Trade Center and the U.S. Pentagon. And they decided to do something about it. And they were the first heroes in the war on terror. And every one of them would have earned the Medal of Honor if they'd been in the military. But they weren't. They huddled together, they prayed, and then they said, let's roll. And they rushed the cabin, and as you know, the plane crashed into Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Thousands of lives were probably saved by that unselfish act by those civilians. Because that target probably was the US Capitol. We then flew to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. I said I wanted to go to a place that had a long runway, good security, good communications, within 45 minute to an hour flight from where we were. We went to Barksdale Air Force Base, the president taped some remarks for the American people. I had to make decisions on who goes with us to the next stop, which was a strategic air command in Omaha, Nebraska. And I decided that those who needed to be on the plane would be on the plane. Those who didn't need to be on the plane but wanted to would not be on the plane. We then flew to Omaha, Nebraska and Stratcom went to a deep bunker way underground. It was right out of the movies. You could see all these flat screen TVs and generals and admirals. And you could hear all of the communication of the FAA and the military. You could hear the fog of war, the misinformation, the questions. There's a plane coming in from Madrid and it's not identifying itself. Oh, wait a minute. It's one of ours and it's coming in from Madrid, Ohio. The president turned to me it said, can we go back to Washington, D.C. now? He had been asking to go back the whole time. And I kept saying, I know you want to make that decision, but I don't think you should make it right now. I checked with the pilot of Air Force One. I checked with the Secret Service. The Secret Service was reluctant, but acquiesced. The pilot had confirmed that Andrews Air Force Base had been swept and would probably be OK. We then flew to Andrews Air Force Base, and on the flight there, we could see on the television screens on Air Force One 
what was happening at the World Trade Center. The buildings were burning. People were jumping out of windows. And then the buildings collapsed. It was haunting. That image still haunts me to this day. The EMTs, firefighters, policemen that ran toward the building rather than away from it saved lives and gave theirs. So Peter was right when he said that the anniversary that we're approaching. Remember what happened. Those of you who are 20 or younger, all you see is a picture. Those of us who are older, and I'm a septuagenarian, that means in the 70s, really old, we promise never to forget, and we don't want it to happen again. So, as we approach September 20th, I'm sorry, September 11th of 2021, please have a conscience to stop and say thank you. Thank you to the heroes that ran toward the disaster. Say, I won't forget you, the people who are on those planes, just going to work, going to visit friends in Los Angeles, excited about the birth of a grandchild. Over 95 people from Massachusetts died that day. We promise never to forget. Don't forget. I'm gonna ask you to talk to someone who's like in middle school today. Tell them about what happened on September 11th. And I'd like you to remember not only what happened on September 11th, but also think about September 14th, 2001. There was an iconic picture of me whispering in the president's ear taken on September 11th. I am not iconic. The photograph is, it does define an era. But there's a picture from September 14th, 2001, that has the president standing on a crushed fire vehicle at ground zero, with his arm around a firefighter named Bob Beckwith. And the president is holding a megaphone. And as he starts to speak, someone in the crowd yells out, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. And the president says, I can hear you. And the whole world will hear us. Everybody in America that day dropped some of their favorite labels. Republican, Democrat. They proudly said, we're Americans. And we were united. As the president was giving that impromptu speech with no notes, nothing practiced, no words suggested to him, Congress was voting on a war resolution. And it passed unanimously in the United States Senate. And with only one dissenting vote and over 400 votes for it in the House. America came together. In the days that followed, record numbers of people said, I want to become a police officer. 
I want to become a firefighter. I want to join the military. I want to join the intelligence services. We celebrate that as we remember what happened on September 11th. So thank you for allowing me to speak to you. I thank the president for the hospitality. I thank all of you for coming. Step back. Recognize the pain that is still felt by many people in Massachusetts. I've addressed the group that works to make sure that we remember their loved ones who died that day. They will never forget, and we promised we wouldn't either. With that, I say God bless you. Thank you to those who signed up and served as policemen, firemen, EMTs. Thank you to those who serve in our military. Thank you for those who serve in our intelligence services. Thank you for those who serve our democracy, especially the ones that have the courage to say, I am running for office and I want to serve in Framingham or Natick or Wellesley. I want to serve on Beacon Hill. I want to serve on Capitol Hill. I want to serve at the White House. We're a great democracy. Polish it by getting involved. Thank you very much and God bless you. Thank you.